This is about it to the time I'm starting this live. If I'm having poor connectivity issues, I apologize. Thank you for joining me for this class at a very different location. I do not have a whiteboard as yet, but I will get myself situated differently. So for today, we're going to start a brand new topic. Last eight weeks, we looked at narrative writing. It was quite a lengthy topic because we had many different paths that we were working with. Creative writing requires a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of introspection and retrospection and so on. But for this class, we are heading right back into our informative writing with persuasive writing. Now, when we did informative writing, we looked at letter writing for formal letters. We looked at report writing like incident reports and simple news reports, and we looked at expository writing. Those three types of informative writing, they are meant to inform and they are meant to give researched data, factual data. When we moved into narrative writing and we looked at creative writing, we were looking at the imagination and the creative process of putting words to images and images into words. Now we're going back into informative writing with persuasive writing. Now persuasive writing is a little different when it comes to information purposes. That's because persuasion is the art of getting someone else to hold the same opinion as you do. Now, opinions are not facts. They can be based on facts, but opinions are not facts. Opinions are how we feel, our ideology, our feelings about something. So as you can see, persuasion is somewhat creative because it requires you to have a perspective right so when we did creative writing we looked at multiple perspective first person perspective we looked at perspective how somebody views the world but in narrative writing that was only for creativity purposes that was for imagination and entertainment which is to give somebody something to consider to give them something that they can give careful consideration and thought to. But with persuasive writing, we're merging the two. We're merging our perspective with factual research. We're not basing it on imagination and creativity. We are basing it on factual research data. So when we're looking at persuasion or persuasive writing, there are three things that we have to understand. We have to understand, firstly, subjectivity. Subjectivity is my perspective based on me, the subject, right? So in my life, one fact in my life will not be the same fact in another person's life. For example, one fact in my life is that I am a mother. Not every woman or female that you meet will have the perspective of a mother because they may not have had any children as yet. So that would be a subjective perspective, which is a view or an opinion that is based on the subject that is viewing from that angle, from that scope. So that's subjectivity. Objectivity are facts that are true no matter who is the viewing subject or to whom you are speaking. So one objective fact is that only women can bear children. That's an objective fact. Biologically, it can be experimented, researched, and surmised. Objective facts do not change on, based on location, or based on individual, right? So China is located in Asia. St. Vincent is located in the West Indies. Those are objective facts. But when you look at, let us say, is Taiwan part of China or is Taiwan its own sovereign nation? Well, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, from our subjective perspective, 
we acknowledge that Taiwan is a sovereign nation. But in China, they hold a very different opinion. So when we look at what is objectivity and subjectivity, there are certain things that, that can come in the middle of your subjective understanding based on, on objective truths. And that thing is called bias. So that's the next thing that we have to look at. Bias. What is bias? Bias is when someone refuses to acknowledge an objective truth because it does not align with their subjective experience. I'm going to take that again. What is bias? Bias is when an individual refuses to accept an objective truth because it does not align with their subjective experience. So a Chinese individual who refuses to see Taiwan as a sovereign nation, they are operating with a bias. They are using their subjective understanding of what a sovereign nation is in order to determine whether Taiwan is independent or not. For someone like us in St. Vincent, where all we have heard is about Taiwan, then naturally we will use our understanding of Taiwan as a sovereign nation to say, no, it is different than the Republic of China because we do not have that bias. Or maybe we do have a bias towards Taiwan. Now we can go into what are biases. There are 25 plus cognitive biases that affect how well we accept objective truths. That would be a psychology class. I'm not going to go into the psychology about it, but I can give you a few examples as we look at the reasons why your persuasive techniques will work most effectively in your writing. So that's the first thing that we looked at in today's class. When doing persuasive writing, we are not only looking for informative writing and informative techniques like research, data, objectivity, and formal language, but we are also looking for your perspective, which is your view of the world based on your experiences, which is what we would have learned in creative writing. That is not to say that persuasive writing is creative writing. It is not. It is not meant to stimulate your imagination for you to escape the world or for you to develop a new emotional or psychological ideology. It might be to persuade you to purchase something. It might be to persuade you to adopt a new lifestyle. It might be to persuade you to stop certain illegal or irresponsible activities. So as you can see, persuasive writing much of the time has a very positive and useful formal purpose. But we are, we are appealing to and we are employing certain creative techniques, which is appealing to someone's emotions and feelings so that we can get our factual information to resonate with their subjective truths. Okay? So the purpose of persuasive writing is to allow someone to adopt or accept your opinion or your perspective of something. I hope everyone gets that. Okay? So when we learn about objectivity, we learned about objectivity in the form of formal writing, those informative pieces that we did, expository, letter writing, report writing, all of those we learned about objectivity. Some of the objective writing styles or writing techniques that we use were, number one, establishing a good introductory paragraph. Now, what is a good introductory paragraph? A good introductory paragraph is one that first has an introductory sentence that appeals to the reader's logic. How do we appeal to the reader's logic? We can use a quotation. 
we can use research information in the form of a fun fact or we can use an anecdote which is our personal experience that has relevance to the topic. Unlike narrative writing where our introductory lines can be a literary device like an onomatopoeia boom bam went the loud clanging sound outside the city wall that's not going to be in persuasive writing but we must have an attention grabbing introductory sentence after our introductory sentence what do we usually have for informative writing we are followed with background information or any definitions and clarifications that may be confusing to our reader if they do not have this previous information. So in the form of informative writings where we may be discussing bulgel, when we did how to make a bulgel for expository writing, many of us did not know that bulgel is what we call codfish. We simply say codfish but the actual name of the dish made with the salted cod is bulgel so we had to provide a definition and a description of what is bulgel for other readers and other audiences who may not know or may not have heard about the word bulgel so after we had our introductory sentence that grabbed the reader's attention, we followed up with our definition, clarification, and description of the information that we were going to discuss in our body. After we gave this background information, we further went on to contextualize our information. In contextualizing our information, we basically gave the audience a brief reason as to why this information is important for them to learn. Because we're doing informative writing, we are meant to teach and inform at the end of our reader's experience. So it is important for our reader to know why we are writing this thing and why this information is pertinent to them. The next sentence that we had in our formula for informative writing is considered one of the most important sentences for informative pieces, which is our thesis statement. The thesis statement basically encapsulates all the information that you will be exposed to in the body of your essay. The thesis statement creates an objective perspective of what the reader is expected to learn when they are finished reading. The same way our usual classes begin with me putting three objectives on the board. At the end of the class, you should be able to know what is persuasive writing, the purpose for persuasive writing, and the structure or the general format of a persuasive piece. That is the objectives of this class. Much like your thesis statement in your essay, your thesis statement will have the three main points that you are going to deliver in the body that your reader should have a clear understanding of at the end of their reading experience. That is your introductory paragraph structure for your persuasive writing, much like that was the structure for your expository pieces. Just to give a quick recap, now when you are doing persuasive writing, your writing follows the format of your informative pieces. Your informative pieces in the first paragraph, known as the introductory paragraph, has an introductory sentence that grabs the reader's attention. You also need an attention-grabbing sentence in your persuasive pieces. However, unlike the narrative where the attention-grabbing introductory section is to expose and excite the reader, these introductory sentences are more to contextualize your information in a logical way, to get your reader to start thinking from their logical mind. 
So your introductory sentences can be a fun fact, a, an inspirational quotation, or it can be an anecdote that puts the information that you will present into context. Your next sentence will then be a definition, clarification, or description of the information that you are going to discuss. So your content cannot just be thrown on the reader. You have to allow your reader to first be exposed to the content in the form of informing them of what this thing is about, why it is relevant, and how you know the, the difference of this thing versus that thing, or how you can identify this thing in a real world setting. Your next sentence is going to sorry if i cannot engage i'm trying to 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 um i am a grade six teacher do you mind coming to do an introductory session with my students home yes please kayleen you can message me and i will definitely do that thank you so much for the invite the next sentence will then be your contextualization of your what we call argument right so when we say argument in persuasive writing it is not an argument as we think in our vincentian context an argument is simply a presentation of two opinions both that have relevance based on factual information so an argument actually has no right or wrong it only has a more logical and a less logical okay so more logical and less logical, for example, is Taiwan and a sovereign nation. Now, there is no right or wrong to that argument. There is only more logical and less logical based on the experience and the subjectivity of the individual who is presenting the point. When you as an individual accept someone's perspective, it is not because you accept it because you know that person well or you like that person, or you, you, you like the way they, they spoke. That's not how you choose the most logical side of an argument. The most logical side of an argument is the one that produces the most subjective facts that are steeped in objective truths to your particular opinion and your particular life experience. So, is it more important for us as a nation to recognize Taiwan as sovereign? Yes, it is. Because Taiwan has done so many things for our country. And they continue to do things to all for other countries around the world. Especially during the COVID-19 pandemic when Taiwan was assisting a lot of other nations in understanding how to deal with the pandemic. Many nations that did not recognize Taiwan as a sovereign nation listed Taiwan as a, a Republic in, um, independent nation. They did not say they got aid from the Republic of China. They said they got aid from the Republic of China on Taiwan. So they recognized the sovereignty of Taiwan at that time because it was most logical to recognize its sovereignty. If you were to ask a Chinese individual, should I accept Taiwan as, as, as a sovereign nation? No, because it's not logical for them to do so. Okay, so don't confuse an argument with a quarrel. So in the West Indies, we confuse argument with a quarrel. A quarrel is when you have two people who are disagreeing based on their feelings, not necessarily factual. Both parties in a quarrel can be wrong. Both parties in a quarrel can be wrong. And if you disagree with that, just think of any quarrel you would have witnessed where you look at them and say, but this person don't have to behave like that and this person didn't have to go that far. And we understand that two individuals may be very wrong in a quarrel and that has nothing to do with objective facts at all. But when we are talking about an argument, we are talking about rhetoric, right? So rhetoric, you would understand in legal terms. A lawyer has rhetoric. Um, somebody who is good at debating, they present their rhetoric. That word rhetoric there is where we basically merge all the three components of ethos, logos, and pathos. Ethos being the authority, logos being the logic, and pathos being the perspective and the feelings of the individual. 
That is when you have an argument. That is when you have rhetoric. Without ethos, which is a, an independent, researched authority body, to back your logos, right, which is the logical process that you came up with this particular opinion, and the pathos, which is a strong feeling that you are correct, and it is applicable to your life because it has proven that it works. That is when you have an argument. If you are missing those three things and you are disagreeing with somebody, then you simply have a quarrel. Okay? So in your introductory paragraph, you establish all of these things. You, introdu you introduce your information with pathos, feeling. You attract the reader's attention through your introductory sentence. But you do not attract them with just random stuff. You attract them with logos or ethos. A quotation from an expert or an authority of someone of high regard. Or you introduce them to logos, which is factual information that has informed your piece. And then you continue with your logos your research information about the background, the description, to clarify and remove any ambiguity from the individual's mind on the topic. Then you proceed with your contextualization, which is again, the pathos. How does this thing apply to my life and your life together? And then we go back to the logos, which is the thesis statement of the three main facts we are going to present in our body. And that's your introductory paragraph. Going back to the informative structure, after your introductory par paragraph, we have the body. The body consists of three paragraphs that follow the same structure in a repeated pattern. Let me repeat that again. The body consists of Three paragraphs that come in a repeated pattern. So when you write your body paragraph number one, which would be your second paragraph of your essay, body paragraph number two and three, which would be the third and fourth paragraph of your essay, they follow the same pattern and it is repeated. Okay? So what is that pattern? Let's see if you remember what that pattern. The pattern is your one transition word. We start each paragraph with a transition word. Why are transition words important? Do you remember? Transition words are like signposts that give direction to our reader. Okay, much like, a po much like a policeman in a traffic area where he has to direct the traffic and give all the signs, transition words give our reader signs as to where they are on this reading experience journey that you are carrying them on. So we start with our transition word and the first sentence is our topic sentence. What is the topic sentence? The topic sentence is the first topic that we are going to discuss in our lineup of topics that were mentioned in the thesis statement. Remember, much like our expository essays, we do not mix up or shuffle the order in which the topics come. So when you list the order of the topics in your thesis statement, the order of your topics remain the same throughout the body of your essay. So the first topic mentioned will be the first topic for your first topic sentence. The topic sentence is going to do the same thing, much like our introductory paragraph. It is going to one, introduce the topic. So as we introduce the topic, we give the reader some again description definition clarification on what this topic is about 
okay so let's say for example we're arguing whether taiwan is a sovereign nation or whether or not it is part of china the first thing we can look at in that regard is taiwan's economy okay so we can look at the economy what is an economy not everyone knows what's an economy or how an economy is established or what even drives an economy so in order for me to get you to see from my perspective why taiwan's economy is something that stands independently on its own which can talk about its sovereignty because let's be real everybody when they start working what's the first thing they say i'm making my own money that is not one of the number one reasons why people assume an adult personality or an adult responsibility when they start making their own money so i can then argue that an economy is how a, a country uses makes and util and utilizes their own money so i can then give a brief description of what is an economy then i will also give context i will contextualize why my opinion of taiwan's economy is important to the argument to establishing whether or not taiwan is a sovereign nation i can explain how an economy is used and how taiwan uses its economy okay then i will support all of my information with factually researched details factually researched details is always going to be the ethos and logos of our argument arguments are not simply based on opinions remember those are quarrels arguments are based on authority and logic that support our opinion so with our subjectivity we have objectivity to remove any bias okay so when we do that and we present our supporting details we look for supporting details that are steeped in expert authority either by an uh, either by an institution or an individual who is considered an expert in that discipline that is to say we are not going to use our friend's name or a, a, a good actress on the television to show our factual information. Whereas we can use that as a persuasive technique to appeal to the pathos, the feeling of the person. So for example, because we have the... Um, Italy was one of the countries that really appreciated Taiwan's assistance in the pandemic. So because Italy now recognizes Taiwan as a sovereign nation that accepted them, is that enough to prove that Taiwan is sovereign? No. But because of the feeling that we share, I can say even Italy sees Taiwan as a sovereign nation since the assistance from the pandemic that is not an objective fact it is simply a subjective fact that appeals to our similar feeling the pathos the logos behind it is the fact that taiwan did help italy and the ethos behind it is that italy is a sovereign nation recognizing a sovereign nation in taiwan as well okay so when we do that we have established our topic sentence in our first sentence. We then go on to describe, clarify, define our topic so that the reader has a clear understanding on the specific topic we are discussing in this paragraph. We will then go on to give our logical reasoning why we think this particular topic is important in the context of the essay. Further, we will assist our factual information with pathos, with feeling information, which comes in the form of persuasive techniques. 
These persuasive techniques, when you are unaware, can catch you off guard. And that's why it's important for us to take persuasive writing and persuasive techniques very seriously. Because most of the advertisements, most of the political campaigns and manifestos, most of anything that is trying to get you to adopt, accept, or indulge in anything, they are using persuasive techniques that you may not even be aware of. So as we use our persuasive technique, our factual information piggybacks on that emotion that is created in the reader. And then as we get them where we want them, for lack of a better term, where we have them logically thinking and feeling is stimulated, we come in with our boomerang statement or our clincher statement and we repeat our fact, we repeat our stance. And our stance will be our reasoning that is based in logic. So if you believe that Taiwan is a sovereign nation, much like most Vincentians, this is when you would reiterate, and this is why I think Taiwan is its own sovereign entity. So I go over that structure because remember, for the second and the third paragraph of your body, which will basically be the third and the fourth paragraph of your essay, you will have the same structure being repeated. What's that structure? Our topic sentence. The topic sentence is going to be the topic in the order it was presented in your thesis statement. Your thesis statement must have your stance, it must have your logical reasoning, and it must have the factual data that you are going to present as relevant to your argument. Not your quarrel, but your argument. So when you have your topic sentence, you then move on from your topic sentence to your definition. When I say definition, sometimes things need definitions. Say, for example, you are looking at teenage pregnancy. What is teenage pregnancy? Now, some may say a teenager that got pregnant. But that's somebody at 19 years of age who has a job and can live on their own, would you classify that individual as a statistic of teenage pregnancy, even if they are married at 19? Because that is legally permissible at 19. So when you say teenage pregnancy, what exactly is your definition of teenage pregnancy? That is one way in which you see where definitions are so important. Much like in the case of the Buljal when we did expository writing. Next, clarification. Sometimes things need clarifying. There are ambiguities, a lot of ambiguities in the words that we use these days. For example, if I'm talking about domestic violence, what is domestic violence? You may say domestic violence is where one individual beats on their spouse. What is a spouse? In our generation these days, we have many different family constructs. Sometimes we have male and female relations, but sometimes we have other types of relations, maybe female and female, male and male. So when we're talking about a spouse, which spouse are we talking about here? Is it the male beating on the female or the female beating on the male? Or a male on a male and a female on a female? These are some of the definitions that would need clarification after we have mentioned the word so when i say definition and clarification this is what i'm talking about certain things that may create confusion or ambiguity in our reader that may hinder their reading experience now when i say contextualize the information what am i talking about now, it's not enough to just start, start talking about Taiwan and China and China and Taiwan. Why is this information important? Now, for you, somebody who is living in a first world country in the U.S., this information may not be relevant. But for somebody like us in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where, let us say, for example, we are approaching the 2025 elections. And in the elections, the two opposing parties the incumbent and the opposition have very different views about taiwan now this argument about taiwan's sovereignty 
and our connection to Taiwan will be important in the general political scheme, but also towards our government, towards our um, trade relations, our international trade relations, other opportunities for trade with other countries, etc., etc. Okay? Also, we are looking at expanding our economy. BRICS is on the rise. BRICS is looking to become a rival to the American dollar with their own dollar that they're going to create in January 2024. Is it wise for us to engage in economic trade with nations like Russia and the United Emirates along with places like Taiwan? Right? So some of these things when it comes to the politics and the governance of a nation, it's relevant in our context. To someone who is in a nation where they can supply their own needs and their first world developed nation. These sorts of arguments do not bear context. Okay? So when I say to contextualize something, let the reader know why this information is important. So if we're going to talk about the economy of Taiwan, why is the economy of Taiwan important? Firstly, what is an economy? And secondly, why is Taiwan's economy important in this discussion? Okay? So after we have contextualized our information, we then go ahead to present our logical reasoning that is supported by research factual data. Research factual data is objective information. So you present statistics, you present researched um, charts, you present... You're not going to put the chart in there, but you will put the chart into words, right? So you will show those statistics and that data and those um, analytics, we call them. You will show those analytics in words, okay? And you will present that information or you can present research information, maybe an experiment that is discussed by some experts in the field, maybe an economist who has clear understanding and critical analysis of certain things, just any expert that has factual information to support your point. Then we will then use our persuasive techniques that will appeal to the person's emotion. That can be a plethora of techniques. You will learn them all in the classes to come. And after you've got the person thinking logically, you've grabbed their attention and their emotions, they are now invested. We repeat our stance with our boomerang statement that brings our point right back home. And you will do this for both your second and third point. Lastly, in your five paragraphs persuasive writing essay structure, you will have your concluding paragraph. Much like your expository, par your expository essays that we did, your concluding paragraph takes the same format. The first thing that you will have in your concluding paragraph is your concluding statement. Your concluding statement is a mirror to your thesis statement. Your concluding statement is a mirror to your thesis statement. So the same way your thesis statement encapsulates everything that is discussed in the body of your essay, your concluding statement mirrors everything that you would have discussed in the body of your essay. So usually you can find your three main points that is in the body, both in your thesis statement and repeated and reiterated in your concluding statement. After you have given your concluding statement, you will then further elaborate on the contextual importance of what the person has just read. Again, it is mirroring your introductory paragraph. Basically, you're flipping it on the upside. So whereas your thesis statement and your stance came last in your introductory paragraph, your concluding statement and your stance will usually be first. So if you have your concluding statement and you have your stance and you have contextualized the information and the importance of it to the reader, then you can go on and leave what we will call your provocative statement. Now when you hear provocative, I don't mean provocative in the sense of being alluring and, and sexy. That's not what I mean. When I say provocative, I mean thought-provoking. 
your thought-provoking statements. So much like in your introductory sentence, you got the reader's attention, right, with that thought-provoking quotation, statistic, or fun fact that you use, in the last paragraph, you will then present a thought-provoking sentence that allows your reader to ponder on the facts that you have presented and create or formulate their own opinion that aligns with your opinion that you presented in your stance. Okay, so I'm going to repeat that. Your last sentence is going to provoke a thought in your reader you're going to, yes, Auntie Nadine, you're going to give them something to think about as they move away from the writing. You don't want the information to just be lost on them. You want them to go ahead thinking about something. So whether it is you want them to think about Taiwan's sovereignty and the assistance that they have given us, if we as a small island developing state, we are going to allow large country politics like the Republic of China to affect our benefits and our opinions about Taiwan and lose all the benefits that we are getting as a country simply because we want to align with the majority. That's a thought-provoking statement. Is it lucrative for you to chase away the hand that's feeding you? with no other assistance in sight, okay? Now, that does not say that you cannot hold your opinion as to whether or not you think Taiwan is moving respectfully or integ with integrity with us. You can have all of those opinions, right? And that, is, and, that is, and that is valid for you to have opinions. Remember, an argument is not saying that you're not going to have opinions. But I am going to present to you factual information that is going to show which opinion is more logical given the context of the individual so in a country like america where they have everything provided for them or whatever this argument is not relevant but for an island like st vincent and the grenadines where our assistance is few we have to ponder on these things so your final statement will be a thought-provoking sentence that allows your reader to do their own further investigating or further pondering on the information that you have presented in the persuasive piece. And that will be your five-paragraph structure for a persuasive essay. So just a quick recap of what we covered in this class. Today we are finally moving on to persuasive writing. Persuasive writing is a form of informative writing that still requires an effective outcome. Effective as we have learned it in the narrative writing sense, where the creative process stirs within us some thought or some ideology of which we must give careful consideration. Like our theme of our story that teach us life lessons, our persuasive essays are supposed to teach us something that should change and enhance our life in some way. Now, an argument is not a quarrel. A quarrel is where two people dispute against something. But an argument is where you present logical information that is pertinent to somebody's subjective truth. Okay? So when we are writing our persuasive pieces, they are not written like narratives. They are written like informative pieces. And when we learned about the informative pieces, we learned about the five paragraph structure. The five paragraph structure requires an introductory paragraph, a body, which is a, consisted of three paragraphs in a repeated pattern, and then our concluding paragraph. In our introductory paragraph, we have our introductory sentence, which grabs the reader's attention followed by sentences that provide description, definition, or clarification on the topic that is going to be presented in the body, followed by our thesis statement, which has our three main points. For the persuasive piece, our thesis statement will also include our stance on the argument or on the topic presented. Then we will proceed with our body paragraphs, which is our first transition word, which allows the reader to know where we are in the, in the writing journey, in the reading journey. 
So we present our transition word, followed by our thesis statement. Sorry, followed by our topic sentence. Our topic sentence is going to say what is the first topic that we are discussing. And we discuss those topics respectively. Not respectfully. Well, we do discuss them respectfully in a formal, logical way. But we discuss them respectively in the manner and order in which they were listed in the thesis statement. After we give our topic sentence, we will then do the same thing. We will define, clarify, and describe anything that we figure is important for the reader's understanding. And then we will contextualize our information by presenting our rational and logical reasoning why we think this information is pertinent to our argument. We will then follow up with factual details from expert authority in order to support our own subjective opinions. After we have received our factual information and received the feeling, we will endorse that with our cinch statement or our boomerang statement, which is basically reiterating our stance, reiterating our argument or point of view. We will do this three times for the three points that we have presented. And lastly, we will end with our concluding paragraph. Our concluding paragraph will have our concluding statement, which is a mirror of our thesis statement and our stance. After we give our concluding statement, we will then provide a bit of description and context to the information that we have already presented, following a reverse pattern of our introduction paragraph. And lastly, we give a provocative sentence or we give a complimentary close, as you would say. As in, you give them something to ponder, something to think about, something to further research and something to be more engaged in the topic about. And when we have done these things, if we have done these things well, utilizing the right persuasive techniques, utilizing the right factual data supported by the right experts in the field in a logically sequenced and a very relevant manner, then we would win our argument. We will now be master debaters. We will have our rhetoric in order and we will be presented as learned companions who can discuss and debate anywhere in the world. So that's what we're looking at, persuasive writing. Now, I don't want you to think that persuasive writing is just debates and speeches. Remember that advertisements are also on the persuasive writing, but because advertisements do not only come in writing, but they, uh, they come in audiovisual media, they come in visual media, they come in audio media as well, they come in so many different diverse ways. I rather do debates and um, rhetoric and persuasive speeches first so that you can understand how the persuasive techniques work before we start looking at the other creative ways that persuasive techniques are used. For example, in jingles, like a song, or color patterns in an image, or maybe um special words like number one doctor recommended who doctor which expert doctor you have to give a name no name no warrant as old people say so you see when we do the writing first and we do the informative pieces first we can then look at the more creative aspects so you'll get your time to do your advertisements and so but let's focus on the writing first so at the end of this class, I am hoping that you know now what is persuasive writing. You understand the purpose of persuasive writing and that you can formulate a structure. Not to say you can formulate a paragraph. I don't expect you to write an essay right off the bat like that. We all know the writing process is a repetitive process. It takes time. But I'm hoping that you at least have an understanding of how the five paragraph structure that you would have learned for informative writing is applied for persuasive writing. So next class, we're going to get straight into your informative, par your introductory paragraph for your persuasive writing. 
get ready to write and come with a topic that you think is important to your community. So much like when we looked at crime in SVG and we looked at theft and we looked at all of those topics when we were looking at cause and effect writing, I want you to take maybe your cause and effect essay. No, let's look at something else that's relevant in your community. There are so many things in your community. So think of a topic that is relevant and widely debated about your community or the country or your gender or something that you find important to you and come ready to give me your introductory paragraph based on that topic so go ahead start doing some research and we will start applying our knowledge of persuasive writing to our specific topic i want to send in some of these um so i want to send in some of these essays to letters to the editor in the searchlight newspaper one of those newspapers so make sure it's a topic that you really want to discuss and that you really want to bring advocacy and awareness to thank you very much for joining me on today's class i hope that it was informative if you have any questions remember that you can message me in the group chat thank you Kaylan. you can message me in the group chat and we can further discuss have a good day everyone